Imagine if you took the city of London, stacked it like a layer cake, put the whole thing on wheels, and then drove it around Europe. That's the premise of Mortal Engines, a steampunk novel by Philip Reeve that tells the story of a distant future where gigantic, mobile traction cities roam the Earth and prey on one another in what's known as municipal darwins. Mankind mobilized. The age of the great predator cities. So what does this have to do with engineering? Well, it got us thinking. Could traction cities ever really exist? It's an intriguing premise and a great thought experiment. So we pooled our collective minds here at engineering.com to answer some basic questions. Just how big are these things? What would it take to move them? How many people can they hold? And what would a real-life mobile city actually look like? We did the math, and here's what we found out. A schematic published on the Mortal Engine's official website indicates that the Traction City of London is 2.5 kilometers long and 861 meters tall. Now, there's no indication of the city's width, but we know for sure it isn't two-dimensional. That would just be weird. So, based on its appearance in the trailer, and for simplicity's sake, we'll assume that London is about as wide as it is tall. The city also has a tiered, uh, vaguely pyramidal structure, with each tier having a smaller footprint, and so presumably less mass, than the tier below it. We're actually going to be making a lot of assumptions in this video, so here they are. We need a starting point for estimating the Traction City's mass, and there's no better point of comparison than a real city. You can find lots of attempts to estimate the weight of a city online, but we wanted a more credible source than some anonymous nerd. That led us to the city of Chicago in the mid-19th century. In the late 1850s and 60s, engineers raised parts of central Chicago by four to six feet in order to increase its elevation and install a sewage system. One of the most impressive feats from this project involved raising half a city block all at once. Using 6,000 jack screws, a team of 600 workers raised 320 feet of four and five story buildings by four feet, eight inches, all without disrupting local businesses or even cracking a window. The April 2nd, 1860 edition of the Chicago Tribune estimated that with a footprint of nearly an acre, the weight of that half city block, including all its sidewalks, was 35,000 tons. Now, if we look at that schematic of the Traction City again, you can see that it consists of eight tiers, each one smaller than the one below it. So we know approximately how much an acre of 19th century city weighs. We just need to estimate how many acres of city are packed into all those tiers. We can do that by calculating how many acres would fit into the bottom tier, multiply that by eight, and then divide the result by two to account for the wedge shape of the city. So using these numbers, we get 2,153 acres, which is about three times the size of the city of London today. By this calculation, the total weight of the payload of the Traction City of London would be just over 73 million tons. That sounds like a lot, and it is. The largest aircraft carrier in service, the USS Gerald R. Ford, weighs about 100,000 tons. But it's not unrealistic, based on London's design in the movie. St. Paul's Cathedral is the one London landmark that's supposed to have survived the implied catastrophe, and the Traction City's designers chose to preserve it by sticking it right on the top. According to its official website, St. Paul's has one of the largest cathedral domes in the world, weighing approximately 73,000 tons, or 0.001% of our hypothetical city of London. Of course, we also need to consider the machinery that powers the city, plus whatever fuel that machinery needs. The best real-world analogy we have for a vehicle so massive is NASA's pair of crawler transporters, built in the 1960s to take rockets and spacecraft on the final leg of their journey to the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. The mobile launch platforms on top of the crawlers have the same dimensions as the baselines on a professional baseball field. Each crawler has a curb weight of 3,000 tons and a lifting capacity of 9,000 tons, or roughly triple their curb weight. If we take that as the basis for estimating the Traction City's mass, including all the machinery, then we get a result of 97 million tons. Now that we have an approximate mass for the City of London in Mortal Engines, we can figure out what it would take to move it. It's difficult to estimate the city's speed based on the trailer alone. But fortunately, the official schematic includes its acceleration and top speed. Since we have an estimate for the city's mass and know its rate of acceleration, we can use Newton's second law to calculate the necessary amount of force involved. A whopping 97 giganewtons. At liftoff, the Saturn V rocket produced an estimated 10 meganewtons of force. So we'd need about 10,000 of those to accelerate London at the official specified rate. In terms of energy input, moving the city just one meter would take 97 gigajoules of energy which is the equivalent of approximately 600 gallons of diesel. Of course, that doesn't account for the efficiency of diesel engines, which we could generously set at, say, 30%. 
which means we'd actually need more than 1,800 gallons of diesel per meter. For comparison, NASA's crawlers consume 125.7 gallons of fuel per mile. Now this is steampunk, and given that the traction cities sustain themselves by consuming smaller cities, it's reasonable to conclude that the city of London in the movie isn't running on diesel. But even if we assume that all of the combustible mass from a captured city gets tossed into enormous furnaces to power gigantic steam engines, that's such a heterogeneous fuel that it's impossible to say what the average energy output would be. The best approximation we can get is a coal power plant. Now, your average coal power plant has a capacity of roughly 3 gigawatts, which means you'd need about 30 of them, all running at capacity, in order to move the city. Obviously, that's going to add a lot more mass, which means adding more capacity, which means adding more mass, and so on. So, big surprise, the idea that you could actually move a whole city if you put it on wheels and fed it enough power doesn't hold up, especially if we're constrained to steampunk-style technology. And we're not even going to discuss the fundamental problem of overcoming the friction in such massive wheels and axles. The thing that strikes me about the traction city in the movie isn't that it's so big and heavy, it's why is it so big and heavy? I don't know much about the story behind mortal engines, but it's pretty clear these cities went mobile in a time of crisis. And when you're packing in a crisis, you pack light. In fact, we think the people of London could have packed a lot lighter, and a lot tighter. Based on the steampunk theme in the story, we're using population data from the Victorian era. In 1901, Inner London had about 4.6 million residents. We have the census data for Outer London too, but I'm just assuming some people don't make the cut. Looking at the area of Inner London, we can put population density at a little over 14,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, but I think we could do a lot better than that. Kowloon Walled City was one of the most densely populated areas ever. It was a lawless squatter enclave controlled by the Triads built inside a colonial fort in Hong Kong. It was 14 stories tall and was basically a cross between a Brazilian favela and a Rubik's Cube. Before it was demolished, the best estimates put the population of Kowloon at 33,000, all crammed into a space 210 by 110 meters for a density of 1,255,000 inhabitants per square kilometer. I'm not saying it would be comfortable. I'm just saying if they've come this far, they need a lot more efficiency and a lot less room for things like dancing chimney sweeps. Also, I don't think they really need a cathedral. Anyway, based on our estimate of the area of the Traction City and the population density of Victorian London, our population density in the movie would be 527,950 inhabitants per square kilometer. Pretty good, but if we redesign London with the density of Kowloon Walled City, it could be about half the size, 47 million tons, net. Plugging that into our power calculations, this denser city would use nearly half as much power so there'd be more room for a city heating apparatus too. We could also push this even further by looking at lightweighting materials. Obviously, they didn't have aluminum, titanium, or carbon fiber in Victorian England, but they clearly had some brilliant engineers. According to Scientific American, reducing a vehicle's weight by even 10% will boost its fuel economy by 6 to 8%. So it's fair to assume that by ditching some of the stone and iron, the residents of Traction City London could get their total mass down to 43 million tons. So mortal engines clearly wasn't written with an eye toward accuracy. But all this estimating and calculating got us wondering, what would a more realistic traction city actually look like? Since it doesn't make sense to stick wheels on an actual city, we need something a little bit more manageable. How about an aircraft carrier? With a displacement of approximately 100,000 tons at full load, the USS Ford is the world's largest. Now, aircraft carriers are often described as floating cities, and for good reason. Once it's fully operational, the USS Ford will be home to more than 4,600 service people and up to 75 aircraft. A cruise ship would be another good candidate, but their lifetimes are shorter and they aren't intended for extended living in the way military vessels are. Now, at almost 100,000 tons, the USS Ford weighs about five times what the two NASA crawlers can handle. So we'd need to build nine more of them if we wanted to be sure they could carry the weight. Actually, for symmetry's sake, let's make it an even dozen. The good news is that there's plenty of space to fit two columns of six crawlers underneath the ship. And of course, we're assuming that it's possible to distribute the weight of the USS Ford evenly among those dozen crawlers without it breaking apart or crumpling around them. But given that they're built in dry dock, and we're trying to figure out how to realistically put a city on wheels, that doesn't seem like too much of a stretch. And here's the kicker. The USS Ford is equipped with two A1B nuclear reactors that can provide enough power for the crawlers, with plenty left over for the rest of the Traction City systems. Although the total output for the A1B reactor is classified, it's estimated to be at least 25% more powerful than the previous generation A4W. 
that would put it at around 700 megawatts thermal. Granted, that doesn't tell us what the reactor's exact electrical output would be, but even if we assume that they're only 25% efficient, they'd still deliver more than four times as much energy as all 12 crawlers would need. So, we have a mobile city with plenty of power, but a tiny population by urban standards. Using the population density from Kowloon Walled City as a reference, it's reasonable to conclude that we could pack a lot more than 5,000 people onto the USS Ford. Maybe not the entire population of 1901 London, but Brighton or even Sheffield? Sure. So, that's about as realistic a traction city as you'll ever see. And the total cost, based on manufacturing costs of the Ford, the crawlers, and adjusting for inflation, works out to about $13.9 billion, or roughly 2% of the 2018 defense budget. Not bad for a mobile city that would actually work. Certainly better than losing $100 million on one that doesn't. So there you have it. Our in-depth engineering analysis of the traction cities from Mortal Engines. Think we messed up? You can double check all of our work on Project Board via the link below and in the video description. Tell us what you liked, nitpick our equations or diagrams, complain about us mixing metric and imperial units. It's all there on Project Board. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and subscribe to our channel to get more content like this, or tell us what you'd like to see more of.